This is the diorama of, of the Paleozoic oceans and seas. Uh, the average age of the fossils that you saw in the first video are 440 million years old. And there are several things that are famous about the locality and our fossils. The Cincinnati and Tri-State area are world famous for our Ordovician age fossils. It is the best place in the world for finding late or upper Ordovician age rocks and fossils. Virtually every museum on earth has within its collections fossils from the tri-state area. The city of Cincinnati lies directly above a huge dome of rock which is referred to as the Cincinnati Arch. The crustal plates of the earth have bowed up and exposed this wonderful ancient Ordovician age rocks to the surface the glaciers that have gone by they have bulldozed off some of the younger layers exposing this Ordovician age where where we live now the Cincinnati arch is not just in Cincinnati of course it extends outward in 200 miles in almost every direction so that includes Indiana Ohio and Kentucky the rock layer itself is called the Cincinnati series it's gray and alternating layers of gray and limestone shale that is to be found underneath uh, the tri-state area. The time period that these, the segment of Earth's history is called the Cincinnati Epoch. An epoch is a smaller unit of time than a geologic period. The geologic period is called the Ordovician period. However, the entire period itself was almost named the Cincinnati. That was the second choice by scientists who voted on it well over a hundred years ago. However, they went with the name Ordovician. The country of Wales, they, uh, that was historically some of the first place that these fossils were documented. This is a poster representing geologic time. And I'm going to show you specifically the Ordovician. This is the present, the Holocene going way back in time. That's the age of the dinosaurs, reptiles, age of the fish. Um, the Ordovician is representing early life, but not the earliest. Some, again, some of the earliest life is the Cambrian and the Precambrian. This is a map of the middle Ordovician. I'm sorry I couldn't find one of the late Ordovician, but this map happened, will make do, to give, show you that the continents were in different positions than what they were today, that the Cincinnati region, the tri-state region, was actually under the equator and under the sea. So anywhere from five to 60 feet of seawater, and we're about 20 degrees below the equator very much very similar to the way the Bahamas is today. Here are some of the brachiopods that I have collected and mounted over the years. And this is one of the largest brachiopods. It's called Raffinesquina. Let's compare that to the smallest one that we find. It is about the size of a BB pellet. Clusters and clusters of these little guys all jam-packed together. And again, what's the purpose? Why show you this? It, again, it is showing the a thriving sea floor community with various species, different zones of different animals thriving and living together. Um, there are definitely overlaps and mixes of these species. Had the deluge Noah's flood geology uh, been accurate, you wouldn't see these seashells arranged like this. Just beautiful. There are over 35 different species of uh, brachiopods found in the Cincinnati. Okay, 
Okay, again, this is my Riker mount of various uh, small brachiopods. Notice the top layer here. This same species is in this big rock. Well, it's only about a foot. Maybe a little more than a foot across, but in it, within this rock, there are well over a thousand individual shells of that type. I'm going to give you a, a close-up. And this rock is packed full of uh, snails, gastropods. There are numerous species. There are at least five different uh, snails species that found in this rock. There's another rock. Again, very full of. Uh, these are internal molds of the snail shells. What I'm holding in my hand is fossilized coral and there's particularly a lot of fossilized coral in some places of Kentucky. This is showing the interior of the coral and all these empty chambers are where there used to be a living polyp, an animal that it's a colonial animal, and in each one of these little chambers, a little tiny animal popped its little tiny filter feeding arms and ate the plankton out of the oceans and seas. Here's a large one here. The point being is the, the coral itself started in very small, humble size and grew and grew and grew. Each one of these chambers represents a passage of time. If you use the comparison of archaeology for a moment, if you found millions of buildings one on top of another you would obviously understand that it represented enormous passage of time with all these reefs one on top of the other and the reefs have the bases of these colonies attached to the seafloor again not broken not washed in they lived grew and died there and generation upon generation there are millions of layers all the way from the Cambrian to the Permian, for example, uh, all the different geologic periods that parts of the United States were under the seas. At the surface, you may only see a few hundred feet of layers exposed that you can see with your eyes. But obviously, under the ground, there are miles of these sediments that you cannot see, and layer upon layer of these coral and bryozoan reefs. My son Keegan drew this when he was 10. It shows and depicts the uh, Ordovician sea life and seafloor. And right up here there's actually a time traveler that has traveled back in time to see these events. We can't travel back in time to actually witness these things. Paleontology, geology, paleobiology, use the fossils and studying the fossil record and collecting fossils to understand what the past was like. Some things will always be a mystery, however the, amount, the quantity of information that we know is huge. It is vast. It fills up several hundred libraries are filled with books on various prehistoric subjects of what we know. There are creation myths and stories around the world by the thousands as well. None of them are parallel with our scientific understanding of the biological world. The difference between mainstream science museums and a creation museum is that the creation museum is pseudoscience. It is religious theology. It is creation ministry. The fear that scientists are voicing is that it will instill a fear and a mistrust of science to more generations of our children in the future. Scientific illiteracy is almost as high as 95 percent in the USA. The big fear is that creationism will affect our scientific literacy as well as our competitive edge that we currently have over the other nations of the world. 
our scientific research is unparalleled. With the teaching and the flourishing of creationism, scientific literacy and scientific thought and progress is stifled amongst millions of children, and which will be the next generation of scientists.